the, we have two things we'd like to talk about tonight in the next few minutes module. And one is three or four generic observations you would make. First, for the hospital or medical people in Atlantic City, and then after that, for the Time Incorporated uh, seminar dry run on the 25th. So we're asking initially what you would, what would be the essential message, three or four principal points which you would like to see communicated to these medicals and uh, hospital managers and uh, representatives. Well, that's a bit presumptuous, but uh, the theme that we've often discussed, Ralph, is that uh, the business of the hospital is to save the patient's time. It's not to make people well. It's to get them out of there in three days instead of three weeks if possible, just as the teacher's business is to save the student's time. Anybody can learn anything if he has long enough. But the teacher's job is to accelerate the learning process to the point where you really save some time. But perhaps in hospitals in general, the um, older pattern that had grown up unconsciously was strong centralizing of functions, services. And the new pattern tends to be exactly the opposite, strong decentralizing of services and functions. And uh, service industries in general tend to take this pattern because their job is, after all, tailor-made, custom-oriented toward the uh, needs of the individual. A centralized service or center is uh, naturally slanted toward the needs of the um, administration rather than, than of the patient. And uh, so, for example, the whole new stress in somebody like Dick Grantley reads, you know, childbirth without fear. The whole reversal takes the form of considering the patient uh, rather than the, well, I suppose the convenience of the doctor or, and um, uh, even taking a father into consideration as a, uh, undergoing trauma during childbirth. But I think that general reversal of direction, the decentralizing, moving uh, hospital services toward the needs of the patient away from the, uh, the advantage and uh, consideration of the uh, staff, is a, a pattern which affects all forms of industry and of uh, service and uh, organization of energy in our time. And it's quite a, a surprising reversal. I think interestingly, from what I've been able to observe, it seems to be the interest of the patient and the doctor as opposed to the institution. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah. And uh, the doctor had identified earlier with the institution than the patient had. So he tended to be a little more. More recognition of both of them. Yeah. The doctor won't come out. Uh, he's, uh, you know, there's, 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 there's difference. An interesting thing in relation to time when you speak of the hospitals, how in one sense the hospitals are still functioning under pre-electric conditions. Mm -hmm. And that goes in terms of electric light. Mm -hmm. Why do they get patients up early in the morning? Mm -hmm. The whole scheduling of doing everything is re in related to the days before electricity, electric light. Mm -hmm. The whole time question you speak of. That's a good point, uh, Tony. That it's not uh, any longer necessary to set the gears according to daytime, but um, Time can be programmed according to electric light. My wife used to be especially vehement about this when we were both working for General Electric, Tony, and she was in a research and development sector, and she used to say to the management there, <coughs> look, General Electric people, you have literally transformed day and night 
by the sheer provenance of that electric bulb up there, and why do you insist upon adhering to the calendar and the chronology of something that has by itself become a kind of an act where actually you can restore and rescale the day to suit human convenience and not to adhere to a time-honored and people-disfavored system, so to speak. This tendency to decentralize and therefore to bring all services within the range of the individual rather than of the administrator is characteristic of many areas of electric servicing in including the book, you see, with xerography, the reader becomes publisher instead of the publisher becoming the centralized service agency. You know, in that light, I was thinking in relation to the packaging problem that the reader can become the producer of the pa The user can become the producer of the package with electricity. The, the consumer can have the machine and determine the package he wants he can electrically uh, question the packaging company. They can electrically supply the answer, which is made in his own plant, in his own place. Yeah. The, it is almost similar. The beginnings of this go back to the role of wrapping paper, you know, which was an attempt to send out packaging here. Form your own packaging by hand, but now it can be done the same design and custom making of a package. One could type in, type in their needs to the company, uh, and the company electrically send back the full. There is an amazing new possibility too. You see, in the result as a result of cellophane transparency, when the packaging becomes transparent, the uh, contained uh, contained objects have to take on a new dimension. They're so visible, regardless of whether they're wrapped or not. They have to have a new character. They have to be more acceptable in their rough and ready form, as it were. And, uh, you know, cellophane, the transparency, uh, translucency uh, in packaging creates a completely new dimension. And it's not unrelated to sound, did because you, sound is more effective. You see these ads for the meat and the AMP, they say the best, the worst side is up. <laughs> and the now, now the oranges have to become more orangey. The apples have to become more aptly, so to speak. And everything has to take on a coloration that even transcends that sort of had in nature in the first place. Yeah, the, you know, I, I'm sure that it's worth uh, meditating a bit on this strange dimension of translucency for wrapping paper. Uh, it has, in, I should think, in many examples, though, reached a state of great inconvenience. Have you ever noticed how difficult it is to remove cellophane from many products? Darn hard. You need a razor blade to even touch the stuff. Um, they haven't quite uh, accepted. Especially oh, when unwrapping can become embarrassing. <laughs> Especially when seeing it on with one of those objects that looks like the old curly eye, and yes, the girls yes. used to use them in their hair, and they brush it across. And it, and they, uh. <clears throat> but it becomes a noisy thing that becomes embarrassing. <clears throat> they sound. Uh, yeah, in public. But to return to another point, Marshall, what would you say apropos of the? Uh, hospital and the doctors, staff, and administration about environment and anti-environment, about the world in which they dwell, well, but which they cannot see. Part of the uh, revolution of modern medicine is that most hospital space, 38% of all hospital space is uh, reserved for patients recovering from therapy. And uh, literally, uh, that um, uh, therapy, as therapy takes on tremendous new uh, dimensions, it also lays low many more patients than formerly. And uh, so the largest proportion of all hospital services are occupied helping people recover from treatment. Uh, they've already had. Which treatment which has been already given to them. So that uh, such is the potency of antibiotics and uh, of these various prophylactics and so on, but they lay low most patients. It's interesting, in light of this, if we notice this idea of publishing becoming individual, there seems to be much more 
outpatient treatment, of treatment of the patients in the home, in the within their own community. And through the druggist. And, and through the druggist, and through the... The, uh, interestingly, when you say that, I was thinking through drugs, but the druggist becomes the same thing. Right. For instance, uh, like Saranac used to be a place people went for a T TB. TB. No longer exists, right. you know? Uh, now how's the management school, as a matter of fact? <laughs> yeah, well, that's another example of decentralizing us of, uh, of uh, medication services and therapy. The um, possibility, well, even, of course, aspirin or whatnot permits decentralization decentralization extremist form the, is, and the manufacturing of drugs <coughs> takes on that role LSD however is a drug being used for the therapy of people afflicted by environments it's a cure for environmental uh, malaise. malaise and saturation it's, it yanks you out of the environment as if on a trip. And uh, this kind, uh, extending the uh, drugs all the way into the psychic domain is a curious one. I'm not sure how far it is to be taken seriously or sanctioned, how far to be implored or deplored. deplored. However, I think we've covered the beat about uh, the hospital. The whole tendency is this decentralizing. As many, many services become available in many, many places, there's not the same need to rush off the hospital. On the other hand, notice that one of the overwhelming facts about hospital is that it's team play. That uh, the medical man goes to the hospital because he can depend upon elaborate teamwork to aid him in any therapy, whatever. It's no longer, uh, it's not only decentralized, but it's uh, corporate rather than private activity. And it really has uh, precipitated and even sanctioned, as Danny Mulletine would say, new work forms where men cohere and collaborate intelligently on a single problem. Mm -hmm. so that the original fragmentation of the <coughs> work or of the operation, well, right? Bernie's point, too, was that in the operating room, you have a high level of coordinated, orchestrated team play. Right. Whereas in the area of ordinary hospital care, you have the more uh, obsolete types of uh, organized uh, or mal-organized uh, functions. Then there's a kind of rude disparity within the organization, organization of the hospital itself as between the coordinating team of surgeons, which is streamlined and immediate and intelligently coordinated, versus the rather uh, serialized, routine, uh, old-fashioned well, kind yeah, of well, approach. In other words, the operating room is run operationally right. and the uh, care, uh, patient care is run bureaucratically. One is made to save time and the other is made to spend time. All right. right. Very good. Let's switch over. Could we stop for a moment? Sure. Yeah. No, I don't want to put those observations down. For no, but this is, this is completely private, Marshall, and, and it's to the point, actually, because this helps provide the... Well, it was only yesterday that we were having words from another type of organization in which they pointed out their horror, lest they become bureaucratized and rigid and brittle and lose their flexibility. And today we were living with the same, those very unfortunate characteristics a highly skilled and highly expert bunch but that, a very narrow expertise that had uh, begun to be self-complacent and self-satisfied and which had no power self-criticism or self-observation no power of flexibility innovation and um, in other words a a bunch of people who just about had it. Does this come in any way from their relation to print? 
and uh, hi-fi photography. Yeah. Marshall felt very, very uncomfortable with these people with the same kind of sensitivity that you have. That I told you. Yeah, right. They were uh, not unfriendly. They were only too no, eager. they're very personable. They, these, these are good guys, you know. They're, and but, in, <laughs> in life at home, yeah, fine. Yeah, but yeah. you're not dealing with them at home. Precisely. You're dealing with them in an area that they are uh, holding on to. That's and right. the freewheeling receptiveness we found with this other organization where, the, where there was an eager exchange and a subtle byplay and a quick apprehension of what Marshall was driving at and then a rejoinder and a question and a dialogue. You know, None of this Interestingly, you would find response at Look or at the Herald Tribune but not at time. Uh -huh. Let's be explicit. Look was what we were talking to. Oh, oh. see, I can see it in the magazine. Yeah. You see, they are, life is, is, is lost. Life is deadly. Right. Life is lost at this time. Life is dead. Life is, is, is a horrible magazine at this point. It's not revealing anything. It's, it's trying to perpetuate a... A, a dead past. A dead it's trying to perpetuate their own ideas instead of looking at life and getting ideas, right, right. as opposed to look, which is is opening up as a magazine. Yeah. I mean, you know, I just can see it in the pages, and that's why I said you wouldn't find this there without knowing anything. You two are very sensitive men. This is exactly what has been haunting Marshall these few days. You've been talking to both these people, Marshall as principal here, and uh, the ver the reciprocity, the sense of exploration and vitality. Life magazine but he found not, the one you know this is like the other. What are your attitudes and so forth to photography? What do you think about the picture? Oh well it's uh, many it's many dimensions, it's many kinds of things. And uh, of course right here the pictures on your wall represent a range which uh, could be comprehended within the life orbit, for example. But within their organization as an administrative unit, it's their uh, insistence on keeping uh, those very kinds of pictures in different uh, departments classified separate, distinct. They wouldn't allow to overlap. They'd have exact names and classifications of those pictures. And they've got reached that advanced state of uh, our classification which makes dialogue among their enterprises or among their departments very difficult. And um, so as we move into the TV age where the uh, Photographic uh, dimensions become rather lo-fi and overlaid. This hi-fi effect becomes alien to their whole needs. What do you mean by hi-fi? Well, hi-fi means a lot of fill-in of data where there's an enormous amount of data filled into the picture as compared with, say, cartoon, where there's hardly any data, just a bounding line. See, somewhere in between there, you have lo-fi. Lo-fi is the uh, world of uh, the, old, the old buggy in the fog. What we saw this afternoon... Steichen is, is lo-fi man. He, he experimented with lo-fi, low-definition. Uh, low-definition involves the sense of touch. You can feel it. You can handle it. Steichen was a great... makes a response from the perceiver that the hi-fi doesn't because what we saw this afternoon, and they were pridefully showing this... Now, let me was... give you examples right there. The lower picture, the gal. Strong contour in the profile. Above it, strong sense of play and action involvement. Over here on the left, much kinetic, you see, the involvement of the muscular as well as the imagery. That is uh, lo-fi or 
low definition because it involves the non-visual senses. Where the non-visual senses come into play, touch and action, you know the, uh, one of these Polish jokes is about, do you know why poles are humped back and have flat heads? Because when you ask them a question, they hump their backs, and when they tell them the answer, they flat their head. <laughs> <laughs> this is the involvement of the other senses, non-visual. So where the non-visual senses come into play, you have lo-fi photography, which is very satisfy satisfying to the ordinary customer. He likes that. And this afternoon, Marshall and I were taken into a kind of muniment room or a secret storage room where they had these color photographs used to pictorialize the books now in the process of being made. And Tony, the colors screamed at you and the lines leaped out at you, didn't they? One after Very another. Very high five. Here, Nothing by the way, this, definition this picture over here you see is only partly visual. The posture and the relation of the bodies there is non-visual. It's touch. Right. Now, in sound, there are equivalent effects, as you know. And uh, this uh, hi-fi sound would exclude touch or interplay of bodies or interplay of forces and would insist on just one instrument effect at a time. That's uh, fragmentation, that's hi-fi, when you just stress one kind of quality at a time. No dialogue, no interplay. Now, what are we working this on? Is, this, and if I can relate it in sound, this is related to, in sound, to the person being more interested in the, in the sound, or the, the, in the old terms, I don't know, the medium, rather than the message. Or the, I, uh, let's let, I'm using massage. The term, uh, no, it is when he's more interested in the, in, in what he's copying than what he's communicating. Or what effect he's having. Yes, well that's what I mean by the, yeah. by the, when he has no attitude towards or relation to what he's copying. And no point of view in relation, or no attitude, I think, is, is, uh, is proper. No attitude towards what he's copying. Interestingly, I can uh, show you an interesting example of this. In recordings I have made of foreigners, the foreigners love them. In the recordings that are made by the standard commercial places of foreigners, they hate them, and I'll tell you why. When I have at least realized that in our culture, when I'm recording a song, I want to hear the song. I have an attitude or uh, an approach to the recording of this. Now, if you listen to most recordings of African music and so forth, are made by people who do not understand the language. And they see the, word, the words just as important as the drum or anything else. And they forget that it's a language. And they forget what there is being communicated right. by this. And they treat everything as sound, as this getting interest in getting everything clearly. Everything equally and everything clearly. And not there was knowing the relationship between sound and voice. I'm in a relationship between the people, what they're trying to say, how people are hearing this, what they are going to get out of it, and so forth. I have an attitude towards it. A relation to it. You see, Batman is a world of uh, sharp contour, like that lower picture over there, the gal with her white. Uh, That's Rena. Oh, uh, is it? Yeah. What you see there? You have a world of contour, sharp outline. That's Batman, which is the world of cartoon rather than the world of pictorial filling. And in uh, sound terms, this means the sudden shock or interface of quite distinct sounds. Uh, which that's what I meant when I told you I, 
that the, the, the soundtrack in Dr. Zhivago is a very iconic or cartoon-like. There's no gradation, there's no build-up, there's no gradualness, it's just wham, bang, like a Batman, you know, crunch, zam, what do they call some of those words? Pow. Pow. The zap-pow. Uh, it's tactile. It's interface. Touch means interface. That's what touch is. It's interface. It's not a separate sense. It's the uh, meeting of senses. So when sight and sound meet, you get this sort of cartoon world. That's the mystery, of course, of the um, cave drawings. Those outlines in the caves have this mysterious power of creating images of uh, enormous involvement. The bounding line on the image is so thick that it brings in the whole human sensorium. The thicker the bounding line, just like the Japanese pen, brings in all the senses, including sound. I think we've had it. Um, sorry. In relation to time, see the areas I begin to think of is that you know how they are going that they are going into other areas of communication, their books, their audio visual areas, and I feel that they are going into them with, without any understanding. real understanding of, of, of developing this sensory perception. Intersensory. They don't want this interplay. They like to keep everything in separate categories. Oh, Marshall, tell, tell Tony, which I thought was very interesting, about Norm Ross's conception of the new city. <laughs> oh, this is, this is rich. Time is cooperating with a group of builders who are setting up experimental cities. For the first time in history, literally, Tony, experiment city. That is cities. From the drawing board. To they're the being planned the way a space capsule is planned, as a total human environment. No additional possibilities. Nothing more ever could be added. Where are these going to be built? One is in Maryland, halfway between Washington and and they're Baltimore. The and one's, yes, yeah. One's in Irving, uh, and California. And I suppose it's, it's it is an accretion from either political or uh, military structures and products that have to be made and therefore the surround of the city follows it's the, like this kind of pattern. they're dealing with the city as if it were a container corporation dealing with cornflakes yeah. they deal with people as if they were cornflakes they, they figure they can wrap them up but good <laughs> and cut them off from all other contacts so they'll never be touched by the human hand or by human sounds. They will have no communication with the rest of the, um, say, the American environment. They will really be uh, sealed off. Well, what be, is their design? Oh, well, it's a kind of uh, uh, prepared uh, and controlled environment, you say. Uh, pure art form. Dealing with the city as if it were a museum exhibition of some precious archaeological treasure. And just cut out all the impurities. Just have pure space around this thing. These are going to be our new ghost towns. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like the 8H, Studio 8H at NBC. Instead of it's Aspen. The most useless place in the world for sound because it was designed to isolate, to keep out sound. And these places sound like they're designed to keep out people. Yeah. Interestingly enough, and uh, this might give us some reflection here, the first one, midway between Washington and Baltimore, mm -hmm. is a political military complex growing out of the extrusion from Washington and so on. The second one, Tony, is in California, they told us. Irving. Which, uh, Irvine. California, is South, California, 70 miles south of Los Angeles. Which is a town built around a university which is in the process of being constructed now. The first 
blush of students moved in last fall and they will begin to thrive and prosper and the town however is being artfully and purposefully put around the university as the center of culture of technology of polity and of learning but what i'm driving at here is in the contemporary scene the two new cities at least the ones that time inc have taken for a kind of laboratory experiment for a five or ten year concreative growth have been a political military one and a university one i think this in itself is a kind of commentary on what is happening today you know and it's uh very much a theory of purity as opposed to natural mix. And yes. just like your um, complaint about these uh, sound studios in which we're designed to keep sounds out. And uh, to, these cities are designed to keep all life out. And all people in. in it's not, it, 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 I just think very much of someone writing a script for life. Yeah. You know? And it's 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 uh, it's focusing on 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 uh, content rather than effect. I think yeah. it's built by oh, yeah. by desire and not by by feeling mm -hmm. by other. Well, oh, there's nothing wrong with these things as purely experimental matters, but the peculiar. Will they allow people to move away? I think that's the measure of whether. <laughs> yes, they will. And the, uh, we must concede the fact they agree, although somewhat reluctantly, that people will be allowed to work outside the immediate per perimeters of the of the city. That most of the work will be carried on within the city proper, so that you will have an a socio-industrial complex that is sufficient unto itself but that certainly some of these people will be commuting to Washington or to Baltimore, as the case may be, even though they live within the new city. You know, I wanted to uh, mention something too that I mentioned to Ralph today. That was that I first began, although I read you, and my thinking has been affected by your writing, actions were affected by, by your talk. I began to use you in my work from the day I heard you on the first place was your film, but just hearing you, one or two of your lines reached me in a way that I could use. The writing reached me in a way I could think about. Well, that figures, doesn't it? The written form is very much in that order. And I, I, from that, I take the idea that we should begin to think of publishing you in sound. I think this is something we ought to think about for all books, Tony. That um, they, with the coming of Xerox, books ought to acquire the auditory dimension. It's perfectly feasible. And uh, this, um, you see, if you ever hear anybody... I'm always forget, uh, I'll never forget the time I first heard T.S. Eliot on recording. The disc, you know, on one side he read Grant Hill, on the other side he read The Hollow Man. And uh, when you hear a poet for the first time, that changes everything about his poetry. His rhythms, his involvement in the language changes totally. Right. Same with Joyce reading from Anna Olivia. You know, I've gone through this whole question of poetry and hearing it and, and so forth. And I begin to think that when you say you should hear poetry, they don't necessarily mean that you should hear someone else read it, but that you should hear it in your head mm -hmm. as you read it, as opposed to uh, reading it without verbalizing the words in your head. Mm -hmm. Poetry is meant to be heard by you in your head. There's a book that you must have a look at by Francis Berry called The Physical Voice of Poetry. And it's a study of what must have been the, the sort of sound that the poets heard when they made their own poetry. That is starting with Chaucer. 
this book studies what did these poets hear as they composed poetry? What they hear is their own voice in their own heads. This changes their poetry, but completely. Depending on what sort of a physical voice they have. And um, uh, Shelley, for example, had a very shrill voice. <laughs> uh, so shrill and so uh, raucous that it put his friends off. That even his friends couldn't stand it. Tennyson, on the other hand, had a great booming, oh, very Orson. stentorian voice. It was a magnificent organ. And uh, his readers don't get it. And I'd love to play you this little piece I have. It's about five minutes long on the sound and its relation to the letter form. Good. Let's hear it. Would you like to hear it? Love it. But you know, you must read this book. Uh, get the title. Uh, uh, it's, by, it's called The Physical Voice of Poetry. All right. By Francis Berry, B E W R Y. And uh, I forgot who published it, but it's not an old, an old. It's not an old book. It's a couple of, all oh, three years old. And. What was the book by Cage you told me about? Silence. Was it called Silence? Yeah. No, no, just, just, just Silence. Just, it's, it's, a, it's a short book, isn't it? No, it's a fairly good sized oh, book. Oh, really? Um, Mistake Beautifully printed. Well, yeah, okay. Because I think it might help both of us. The um, their list, all sorts of things came to mind. And um, apropos of that, where where we were earlier, there's a nice illustration of the effects of uh, the written word on speech in Eliot's uh, Wasteland. And uh, it, it's the, key, the clue or cue comes from his use of the name Mrs. Equitone. But I heard when Elliot reads it, when he's recording the poem, and by the way, there's a, an area of study. The effects of uh, the poet's recordings uh, on, in our time uh, have been tremendous. But um, when he records it, he simply reads the lines. Tell dear Mrs. Equitone, I bring the horoscope myself. One must be so careful these days. You see, you mimic the effect of typography with the voice. Equitone. You see, in, even the voices on um, that tape are close to uh, printing because of the equality. The, the amount of variation in rhythm and so on is slight compared to any... Well, you take Joyce's opening of his recitation. Uh, Will you know, or don't you, Kenneth, or have it? I told you, every telling has a tale, and that's the he and the she of it. Now, this is a non-literate speech. The brogues of the world, or uh, dialects of the world, Negro or otherwise, are, are not affected by print. No leveling off of nuance and pattern, you see. That's why they can perform in the musical world so much more freely than the literate man. But this Mrs. Equitone is really a very useful bit because the whole British upper class mimic, with voice, they mimic the world of printing. This puts the lower classes way down because they still retain many of the characteristics of pre-print in their voices. So the class structure in England is quite simply simulating print with the voice. Tell dear Mrs. Equitone, I bring the horoscope myself. Boy, does that fix people. It really, you know, puts the clamps on. <laughs> the, uh, it's comical, of course. What but would you say the effect of recording some poetry or the poet's reading poetry has had? You know? Oh, well, it has involved readers in the, uh, in the whole poetic process as never before. Oh, heavens. When you actually hear Elliot or Joyce or... Dylan Thomas, reading that stuff. Why, it makes you feel that it's a normal part of human speech and behavior to be poetic. Oh, sure. And uh, I think you can really translate the word creative or poetic quite simply into probe. And that at all times, any creative person uh, is probing, exploring his environment. And uh, the ordinary person doesn't probe he reposes in the environment, he wraps it around himself uh, like a familiar setting or chair or something. But uh, the poet tends to be a bit of a, um, a delinquent, uh, you know, sleuth, bogart, bond, 
explorer. But I meant I, I, me I heard that Jack Benny show revived recently. Uh, not a Fred Allen show. I'd like to hear a Fred Allen show again. What amazed me about the Jack Benny uh, revival show was the tremendous speed with which he delivered his gags and his uh, words. Very hi-fi, very fast. Whereas now, since TV, he's slowed down. He smiles slow. No hurry. Um, the fast gag man of the uh, radio days uh, couldn't exist on TV. You know, an interesting comparison of two shows. <coughs> Norman Corwin did uh, a thing called On a Note of Triumph. It, it was played, it was written to be played the night after the end of the war. Mm. It was all symbolic, all poetry and so forth. You listen to, to that today, it leaves you cold. You listen to an actuality broadcast of the British, uh, that the British made a whole series of records, you're as involved in that as if it were happening today. It's all reality material. What, uh, what uh, sort of a broadcaster was it, the, the reality broadcast? Well, the reality broadcasts are interviews with the people oh, yeah. on the battlefield, are oh, yeah. the sounds of the battle, and so forth. The other is poetry and music relating well, to Well, it's it. packaged. The, uh, the reality broadcast, you see, isn't packaged. Uh, and packaging really means putting something around something. It's container corp. Uh, but the, in England, before the war, the thing grew up. Alec Comfort, the poet, was one of the inspirers of the movement called Mass Observation, in which uh, the sort of reality broadcasting was done. Uh, they had teams of people who were simply going out, talking to people casually in ordinary situations about what was happening. And that idea of the informal, the unpackaged, but the, the Corwins or the, um, who's the old um, um, voice of NBC or from or the um, Mark. Victory at Sea? Um, oh, who's he still around? The, uh, You're not thinking of Murrow and Friendly here, no? No, no, no. no. Uh, the voice that they used on the Victory at by, Sea. By the way, the Orson Welles yeah. uh, broadcast of that uh, invasion from Mars. <coughs> If you, I remember hearing it the night it was on, and I have a recording of that program that I uh -huh. listened to just a, you know, a few months ago. It is so ridiculous and so uninvolving now, and yet it had the country in its clutches at that well, moment. Yeah, but there again is style. Well, I'll come, come around to something like that in a moment. You know Glenn Gould. Uh, did I get Yes, that I saw down? that piece, and I felt that he was searching for something, but he had so many errors in that. He was, you know, so yeah. he is still related to his performance of music. He, uh, he was recognizing certain problems. He feels that the concert hall, though, is not the right place for the performer anymore. But uh, I'm sure he hasn't straightened out all the... Yeah, but I don't think he's as free as Jimmy in saying, let's go out to the street oh, and no. bus terminal or let's... Oh, quite true. Oh, he's still a very academic performer. Uh, one of the areas that uh, we might be able to illustrate on June 27 would be the effect of sound on changing photographic methods. When sound movies came in, it changed the whole photographic pitch. And uh, the difference we're talking about between radio and TV sound, between involving and uninvolving, is a difference between uh, silence and talkies regarding the photography. Uh, the photography as far as I've noticed, had to be stepped up to much higher intensity with sound. You see, when you're listening to sounds, you uh, form as a, a, a visual track all the time. And uh, when you're looking at pictures, you form a soundtrack all the time. The human being provides one. Well, I've been, I bought color TV last week, and I noticed a fantastic difference between the two. First off, I put the two of them in front of my daughter and asked which one would you like. She picks the color. Uh -huh. But apart from that, I find that the people that I, I used to watch the Johnny Carson show late at night, the people who were celebrities on the black and white, on color, they're real people. I can see the shading, I can see the skin, I can see, I see them as real people. I can see the color of their lips and so forth, as opposed to um, black and white, where I supply an image of them. I supply the rest of the image in my feelings. Mm -hmm. And I find that they are more real as people and less of this great figure with color. By the way, there's a phrase, this might have some use, 
Has the message changed? Uh, has the well, message changed? My, well, own, my relation to color has changed. First it's, it's a new much, medium. It's, much easier it's not the old eyes. medium. It's much easier on my eyes. Color is not uh, the old medium. It's a brand new medium. It will change everything, including the content, in a short time. That's where Batman came from. Uh, the new uh, color medium requires the cartoon world, not pictures. And uh, you see, there's a phrase, there's a phrase, well, TV. Why, why do you say that? Well, there's a, there's a phrase, what is called information theory. It's not a very a useful phrase because it misleads people. Information, uh, information theorists will say, in a photograph, there is no information. Too many data. In a cartoon, lots of information, very few data. What they mean by information is structure, just outline. Now, TV is, a, is by comparison with a photophotography, is information. It's cartoon. Something you did at your Channel 13 thing gave me an idea that I bet would blow a certain type of commercial apart. Remember you had that drawing of the outline shapes of people and, they, uh, and the numbers in them? Remember that one? You know, for instance, the Life Magazine will have a picture of, uh, of uh, 30 people, the graduating class of Cornell of 1914, then they will have a little drawing of just the shapes of the people standing there with numbers yeah. and their names below yeah. it. Yeah. All right. You take these testimonial commercials, <laughs> and you take and just have the outline of the person, and they're talking about, about how it cured their headache. You will find that people will be much more involved than seeing the person really t in full camera in uh -huh. full picture time uh -huh. about their headache. Because oh, yeah. they can paint their own picture of the oh. person the other way in that shape. They will also find that it will not be a specific person, but it will be, if the sound is no. convincing and real, it will say that this is anybody and it's real. Whereas the other way, it becomes just one person and real. And right. it's a totally different... But you see, the reason the kids will buy cartoons any time ahead of picture books is just that. So much has been left out. There's big space for them to get in. Ambiguity. That's, uh... That's another way of getting into the act. You see, the clear, distinct, precise scientific statement leaves no room for anybody to get in. <laughs> Stay away. It excludes. Anything specialist and intense excludes. Now, the... Um, the cartoon uh, includes, and um, color includes even more than black and white, because you see the eye, it is the periphery of the eye that sees black and white and movement. The center of the eye, the cones, see color, and that's much more involving than, uh, than movement and black and white. So color will have a complete, uh, transform the whole programming of TV eventually. And will change. It's a new environment too in the outside world. And uh, it affects the way you see. Have you watched the fire in black and white and the fire in color on TV? No, I haven't seen anything like that. What do you mean the fire? A fire. A fire. Oh no! Uh, a oh, 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 building burning down. But it reminds me of Johnny Cage's remark. Remember, when in trouble in New York, the cops told no, this Johnny. This is mine. That was your mom. You told me. Ah, oh, well now look. I want, I'd like to be able to track that down a little further, just no, in case. I told you that a cop one day told me no. that if you I know. ask for, for if you uh, yell help, if you're in a lobby and someone comes up and attacks you and you yell help, he says no one will come. He says yell fire and all the doors will open. That's right. Now you see, see this is, attack, yell well, fire. I didn't do that, but I, I wanted to bring out some yeah. but you see, images. This is, a nice, this is a nice way of getting it hot and cool. Uh, well, the the yelling help is cool. Uh, and is involving, and nobody wants to get involved anymore. They are already <laughs> involved far too much. But if you say fire, they'll rush in because there's no involvement there. You just put the fire up and beat it. Well, I saw it on another. Uh, literature is black and white. It's very hard to see color in literature. But Max and Gorky has an essay on fire, and yeah. you see color in that entire goddamn essay. Yeah, well, that could be. Now, I would like to put color. the uh, image of yeah. a building burning down in color. Yeah. Your eyes in black and white, and I'd like to see how you react to that. Uh -huh. Oh, well, I, uh, my reaction wouldn't be any different from anybody's reaction. I, I have the idea that one, you're, one is it, one is a danger you're staying away from. Well, you see, uh, no, no, it's literally, uh, the funny from. thing is, here is, uh, here is a pun in a nonverbal form. The fire is uh, really saying a very hot situation does not involve people. They get back. They don't feel involved. 
Help means you must hurry in here and involve yourself. Well, that's only one aspect of what's going on. Because, look, realistically, when, when some, if someone yells fire, I want to not be in danger. If they yell help, there's a chance of my being in danger. Of course, but that's involvement. Okay. Now, uh, uh, the, 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 when they yell help, that means they want you to get involved in their life. Yes, the involvement <clears throat> I accept. Well, no, most people don't accept it. They don't want to have no, anything to do with it. No, what I mean it. by accepting is that I accept that part of your statement. The other part of the... Of the, fire? the, the, the you mean you might... Out because of the fire because they want to protect themselves. But the protection takes the form of detaching themselves. Don't you see? The, the, as in any hot medium, you detach yourself. You become objective. You become a spectator. You don't get involved. Yes, but the more you hot up, this house is burning down. I want to get the hell out of that's it. That's not involvement. Uh, you see, it's a hot uh, yeah, medium you that you want to. That's all right. But that's true of all hot media. You want to get away from them. Yeah. That's the point. So uh, the. Uh, that's why they say shut off that radio? <laughs> yeah, that's hot. You want to get away from it? No. But uh, the the reason that people will help with a fire is uh, quite simply, of course, they don't want to get involved in a, in a fire in the sense that it might surround them. On the other hand, the, uh, a fire is a very impersonal thing, uh, whereas a person in need of help is in a very personal problem. And uh, fire is not personal. It's purely objective. You rush in with an extinguisher or anything available and you put it out. But there's no personal involvement. How about fire as an object of art? Suppose I had a fire museum. You'd oh, come they, in, and immediately oh. I'd be burning wood, yeah, oh, and then I'd be, wonderful. be burning sulfur. Wonderful. Be bur It'd be a beautiful thing. I'd have you could have a, a great spectrum of experiences. But, there, you know, there's in music, but there's a great range of fire music. Isn't it possible that uh, we react to fire with... Uh, feelings that we never knew we had before. No, Maybe no, no, it's very, back. no. From the time you first burned your fingers, you have all sorts of feelings available for fire. But it isn't a uh, feeling for fire something that might be handed down in our genes? Oh, no. It, uh, it, it, well, it may be, but it doesn't uh, necessary to uh, suppose that. It's quite simply that physically you try to get away from it as much as possible. And uh, any hot form of experience invites people uh, to uh, get away. By the way, there's a, a famous old story about the uh, the north wind and um, the sun decided to have a little battle about who could exert the most power on some. I read this since I was literally in grade five, and uh, the the uh, the north wind blew like fury, and the guy nearly tightened up his clothes on. Then the sun came out and beamed on him, and off went the clothes. But uh, yeah, hot. Uh, the hot is uh, much more uh, inclined to get people away, detached. Print is hot. It detaches people. Um, handwriting is not hot. It involves people. It's cool. You know, I wanted to have a message on the on the commercial, and I just wanted to have the end, writing the message over the picture. Just writing it. That's TV. The scanning finger is writing on the wall. If you were to pick up a bottle on a shoreline, and you pulled out a typewritten message yeah. with the word help, you wouldn't be as involved as a handwritten message. You know, I, I think no, it's no, no, no. circumstance. Oh, yeah, yeah. But if you, you know, there, there's so many... Uh, you know, if you want to work at that, uh, strictly that's the red herring department, which you might and, well encounter on the seashore. But the, uh, the bottle, you see, uh, the bottle, the message in a bottle is like something overheard, not heard. Something is overheard. That what we want in advertising? That, Oh, just a moment. Wouldn't you drop in Life Magazine Look, a handwritten ad? Just no, just, to get this no, no, just a moment. Uh, the uh, overheard message, if you hear somebody in the barbershop saying something to somebody about something terrific, that has a far greater effect than somebody telling you something. Would you let me do one of my columns in handwriting in your magazine? Yes. Okay, I'll do the, the, over, okay. the overheard is far more potent than what you hear. The, 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 these awful noises that come off the uh, commercials uh, are so hot, they drive anybody in to, to cover. And uh, the, um, they should be cooled down. Very cool. You know, I have two other things that are interesting for you. This warden had a problem with too many guys wanting to go into solitary confinement. <laughs> So, this is like the Trappists. They now got guys who want to get off and be hermits. So what they did, 
the warden decided, you know, since everybody had bread and water, that the water would be served in baby bottles. <laughs> and they cut down the guys that went into, you know, like 4%. <laughs> Guys that wanted to go into, you know, did things that got them into solitary. Why didn't they use diapers also for these guys? Dress them in diapers and great deterrent, <laughs> indeed. Well, you know, Wingate Payne's office is done in fur, wall to ceiling fur, and goes in there for about 20 minutes a day. Once uh, back to the wall. Fur below. Right. Fire, fur, fur away. That's interesting. What's it sound like? But look, they want to try an interview on there? So trying to think, Tony, for my benefit on yeah. June 27th of some way of illustrating the effect of sound on pictures. In the section on movie, I do have a few observations on it and pointed out that what is, as far as I know, and, uh, oh, I have a beautiful way of showing this. Yeah, an good. exquisite way. I can take a scene where... I, I did this for the traffic commissioner. I have a scene where they show pictures that are cuts the whole thing falls apart if you put the actual sound of what's happening there. The minute I put a church bell tolling against this, everything, everything falls into place. Everything falls into place. Wonderful. Wonderful. You know? By the way, notice that Bell, like for whom the bell tolls, or tolls, Bell is a great big communal sound, all embracing, and has been so used for many centuries. It's a communal image for participation. It's not a message beamed at anybody. Oh, yeah, the little chapel bell, the high-pitched bell, that's an immediate uh, message to a particular sector or a segment, come now. But the big bell is not for that purpose. But, gee, that'll be great, Tommy. That's what we need. Uh, I'm sure it would be possible from the library at Museum of Modern Art to have them extract the before and after effects in pictures. One of the things you see, the Russians have never been able to make pictures since talkies. They were, the, they were the great maestros uh, of film as art in the days of the silence. They are themselves a very ear-oriented people. And when sound came in, it intensified the visual image to a point that they found utterly uncongenial. And they never did make pictures again. Um, they still haven't made pictures since sound. And um, they are, however, beginning to make pictures with higher visual uh, intensity and um, may eventually begin to experiment again with pictures. But it was only at a certain level of sensory mix, as it were, that they could be experimental with film. Do you want to comment from Marshall in the uh, annual? She would like it. I agree. You want to tell him what you want? Uh, Say something to this so, does he want to finish with his notes? I'm just no, fascinated I'm just, by what this triggered in his mind. It's, uh, I, I'm just running through a few uh, notes, but uh, what uh, were you going to uh, suggest? Uh, we have an annual, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you were. And this is an annual, annual for which enterprise? Photography. Photography, I think. Yeah. John is the editor of Popular Photography. I think. Uh, you'll send Marshall a subscription. Sure. I think you you have one coming up there. Good. I, I was a address. fellow who wrote you a note saying I would trade you tons I, of war. I haven't been home since then, as it were. I haven't really and sat. You got to him before. Yeah, I haven't sat down at home really since that time. I didn't really get to look at your note. I didn't realize it was the same guy. But um, well, anyway, we you were going to. We also did the editorial on your soup for breakfast. Oh? I don't know if you're aware no, of that. But what had you in mind then uh, for the annual, or possibly? Uh, I was uh, intrigued and baffled by your chapter, Photography, the Brothel Without oh. Wall. No, that was movie. Not photo. Have you reread the chapter lately? You don't no. pinpoint it. No, it's a, a movie, Brothel Without, uh, Brothel Without Walls, but uh, that was the subheading of the movie chapter. Not the, that was, I forgot what the subhead of the photo chapter was. It wasn't brothel. Photography, the brothel without walls. And not what I have for movies then. Uh, Is there a copy? You I have a copy? Yes. Oh, well. Well, I went across the United States in a flying short course, and I probably sold more damn books to people who hate me now from reading it, getting very upset about uh, what's happening in the world of vision. And I uh, used quotes out of this thing. Now, the brothel without uh. walls had me thoroughly baffled. Oh, well. And I it was based on some observations made by Rennie Clare. 
in which he pointed to the, uh, the strange power of the uh, photograph or the movie to penetrate the world of flesh and the textures of flesh. And so this is a very brothel-like dimension, the working with flesh and textures. As the movie, uh, paradoxically, as the photo has improved, it has become less and less visual and more and more tactile, textural. At the more hi-fi you go with pictures, the more you get textured surfaces. You penetrate wood, cloth, stone. You do a hi-fi, do a hi-fi study of stone, and you don't get visual. You get tactile imagery. Uh, the, the, uh, in the world of flesh, the photogra photograph is, in that sense, brothel. Is that what it sounds? Brothel. Uh, if, uh, is that brothel? What that was? Well, the photograph. Brothel without walls. That's yeah. What do I have for movies? What do I have for movies? Well, I'm looking for the movie. <coughs> movies. The real world. R. Ah. E. Okay. I okay, forgot. If, I never if open if a book movies, again once it's published. Well, I never do. I can sympathize with you. I want those too. Uh, now, if the movie is a brothel without walls, what is a still photograph? Well, I don't. We're, we're still talking about photography as brothel. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is what... The yeah, I know. We're not talking about that still. All right. You said that the brothel without walls concerns motion picture, and here is the photograph. The brothel. It concerns it in the sense of texture, uh, flesh textures. You, you can penetrate, and there is no privacy uh, conceivable or possible with a uh, photograph. It invades. As the telephone invades the ear world anywhere, the, the photo can invade any part of human life, uh, inside the body, outside the body, so on. And uh, it's simply this invasion of textures and surfaces that uh, is in question. Uh, you understand that these statements are intended to be very controversial. Uh, I never make a statement as just a nice packaged piece of information about anything. I would never bother to say I, anything like that. I accept it as such and I admire you. But I, know, but I do it uh, deliberately and experimentally. Well, and that an English teacher should lead us in visual communications is just fascinating. Oh, well. <laughs> it, and I doubt that you've ever made a film or taken a picture. Oh, well, uh, well, not especially. I, I'd like to have taken a few, sure. I've and made a few. you come more. in as the critic of our area, and uh, in that you're raising the questions in our mind, and you're very important for this, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to... Like yeah, no, no, don't. <laughs> no, now, uh, is the Canadian the leader in the image world today. The Canadian I know. has a mass I figure should, based I should, on... I should doubt it. Uh, we have a mounted policeman up there, and that's about all. And the two line. Don't forget the two line. McLaren, the Canadian Film Board oh, movie. Norley Fry. Film Board and Stills. Norley Fry, the archetypal an lecture. An American, a Frenchman, and an Englishman <laughs> across your photo exhibit at Expo 67. <laughs> well, that's, you know that they, they would never draw on local talent for anything that they wanted for exotic effect. The uh, natural. However, who, who cares? But that's nothing paradoxical. Uh, about that. Hey, I want to tell you something. I've got a lot of other notes here. We've got to get going, you see. We have an appointment. Uh, but here is one that may have some uh, uh, meaning. It happened a few days ago in Toronto. A little, note, a little picture in the paper. Some school kids um, had got together, dug up some money from the class, and they bought an out-of-door ruddy coaster sign on which they had written, happiness is having Miss McKeon and Mr. Pratt, their English teacher and their history teacher, both of whom were leaving the school. They put this on a big public sign right out on Bathurst Avenue, which is sort of big thoroughfare. I was struck by this as a lyric personal use of a public medium. I knew it was going to happen sooner or later. I never heard of it happening before. It's like taking a Coke ad and turning it into a personal sonnet to one's wife. And using a public form for private expression. Now this is, comes naturally to this TV generation. They're not the least bit inhibited by public media. They accept them as their personal language. Private. I did the tribute to my mother when she died on radio. No, my program the next morning. There is an American film with Jody Holiday, 
in which she buys a billboard in Times Square and puts her own name on it to become famous. I remember that. Some of his used this as a, as a, as a way of but getting, getting these, his wife to come back to him, uh, use the billboard. Yeah. Well, it's not, it's like, now the English come to think of it, have used the front page of the Times for many years uh, for personals. Strictly personal information. Come back and all will be forgiven on page one of the Times. Uh, they've used, in other words, news, public news, as private message. But they've suddenly dropped it uh, after uh, many, many years. Marshall, which was a great mistake. Suppose I give you two pages on a magazine and pay you for it to do a want ad page for what you expect of the visual and sound people of our time. Would you do it? Sure, it would be nice if I could get some of these other books written first. I, I'm, I'm not going to take on any more assignments until I've got my obligations attended to. I, I really have tremendous, a lot of work to get done. I've always come to the other point. Uh, there's a, um, there's a, um, apropos of your idea of um, World of Studio, look in the same way at the total world environment as campus for learning. Dialogue can now take place, again, with the aids of the, the tape recorder type anywhere in the world. Any part, under the water, above the earth. Uh, well, look how much human interest is now coming out of these capsules. Uh, anything said in that environment is top human interest. But human interest, by the way, means involvement, as opposed to a new story. A story is not human interest. Uh, that is an ordinary news story. It's not human interest. It has to have a certain dimension for involvement, where you can complete the rest of the factors yourself. This is true in pictures. You see, the uh, pictures that uh, are permit a high degree of fill-in, like that one, you see, uh, the, uh, that l larger portrait there, uh, compared to with the snapshots up there, you, there's much more to fill in photographically with your senses. It's more abstract. Abstract art means leaving a lot of things out so that you can get into the picture. You know, I, I, I'm struck by something very uh, unusual. You always go like this when you say involved. No, because now, right, wait, wait. Tell us. I, I walk down the street and I keep, when I see guys go like this, I think of the same that, you know, and it's the same involvement in a way. You know, I mean it's a oh, very wow. involving situation. No, no I'm i I'm serious. No. There is oh, involvement wow. in both situations. Well when when uh, people do gesture, it is because they are using all the all the senses at once. You know, they've discovered that kids with reading difficulties can be helped by getting them on the trampoline. And when they get using all their muscles that can overcome visual difficulties, uh, that merely when they're trying to isolate one of their senses, they get into troubles that they can overcome by using all their senses. Well, in many of these backward territories like France and Italy, they use all their senses. They, uh, they, you know, they gesticulate wildly. Gee, that's fascinating. That explains something. In Wall Street Journal this week, there's a uh, <coughs> item about a golf school, a famous golf school. <coughs> They will sell you for $499 a movie camera and give you instructions in being a photographer so you can take your own picture. So maybe through the vision of yeah. making a movie, you can become a better golfer. That That's right. Oh, I'm sure you could. You, it's, a by, it's by feedback. You see, what happens, with feedback is a form of profound involvement. Uh, anything that loops back and, and brings you brings you in to the whole process again. I, I said today in a commercial we work on, make a mistake and leave it in. I say first off we get the oh. client interested by doing oh, it, yeah. but let's leave it in the commercial. Make oh, a mistake that doesn't affect us. People right. will be calling in, be involved in this. You see, the correctness is mechanical. Any correct flowing performance is purely mechanical I compared said, to a mistake. This the dropping of the the sound of the dropping of the lid. Four seconds later. Oh, here's one for you. Well, there's a chap at Rochester who had the curiosity to put a, a tape, a, a mic, in the crib of a small infant to pick up all the sounds that a small infant hears. I have that. I've done that. All the talk that people no. speak to. Well, well but listen, yes, guess I, what? Guess what came out? The icebox. The icebox door is the overwhelming sound that any small child hears. <laughs> not traffic, not voices. The icebox. Clonk. <laughs> over and over again. Yeah, how about that? What was some of the other points? It's an environmental sound. Um, the, uh, the, um, oh yeah, Greek movies. Have you ever watched one? Like Electra or uh, the um, Medea? Mid well, there, there are quite a few modern 
Greek movies and uh, try one, and you'll find that they do them these tragedies out of doors the way we do westerns, and they at once become plausible. Tragic emotions make sense at once once you get out of an enclosed theatrical space into the out of doors. The, uh, the form of the emotion then becomes environmental. It isn't just private anymore. It becomes a typical role-like emotion. It uh, really is a, a very great experience. Now, our Westerns, you see, have that power of using the out of doors, unenclosed space for shaping emotion. It's like your clarinetist. By using the out of doors for the shaping of emotion, they come up with a pattern of emotion that people find immediately plausible, meaningful, involving. Now, the no theater, no legit theater, has this resource. It can't go near that dimension of legitimate tragic emotion. So that uh, the westerns, the out of door shows, have a tremendous lot of resources utterly untouched by the indoor uh, theater or indoor movie. And um, you know, they, they, they don't have sets, you see. In the, in the Greek movies, there are no sets. They just use the damn rocks and the ground. And uh, just as in a Western, there are no sets, except in the, when they rush into town. Eh? But, um, yeah, that uh, dimension, the changing of the image, photographic or in any sense, by getting away from enclosed spaces, and same with sound, really. You were explaining that uh, you get away from the end closed and the sound takes on a new dimension altogether. There's a tremendous world uh, for you to keep in mind. You probably have thought about it. Linguistics. In terms of the creative use of the tape recorder, the whole science of linguistics has come out of it. Because with the tape recorder, it became possible to arrest, isolate certain rhythms, patterns, and study them, play them back. Linguistics is a study not of semantics or word meanings, but of gestures and rhythms of language. A complete new dimension of speech has opened up with the tape recording. And now it becomes possible to know why children are able to learn their mother tongue in three or four years. Because the kids don't approach uh, objects by uh, semantics. It isn't the meaning of words that they first get, it's the rhythm the patterns of, of syntax and so on, they don't get it grammatically or by understanding what it means. They get it by straight involvement in the rhythm and by using that rhythm themselves then as a toy to play around the world with. They try it out, they repeat it, they repeat it, they repeat it. So the, the literally though, uh, uh, linguistics, which is a pretty exciting world uh, of new study, came straight out of tape recording impossible without it. And, of course, without the mobility and portability of the tape recorder, you couldn't do a linguistic study. But, uh, that's, uh, there, uh, I just scribbled those down as we went, but there's lots that... They uh, haven't begun to use the, interestingly, they don't use the recorder as a creative tool in the study of linguistics yet. Very few people. I mean, I imagine it's one in a million that puts the recorder in the crib to see what the oh, yeah, says. That's so right. oh, that's they're right. using it in the school, in the classroom, in a confined little yeah. box that the person sits in in the space oh. capsule. You know, hey. and that's where the study make uh, make a note of this book. I think you'd find a lot of interest in it. It's called The Lore and Language of School Children by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Opie, O P I E. I think it's Oxford Press. But it's a study of the actual songs, games, phrases, slang, jokes, gags, everything that kids use in the schoolyard. Now, when they began this study, or rather the result of the study, they discovered that in Melbourne, Australia, or Belfast, Ireland, or in the Bronx, the same jokes, games, gags, and the same as had been going on for centuries because these uh, things are not taught by adults to children but by children to children. Yes, I say that in the collection of folklore, I say the, the, uh, the, the 
transmission era is is two or three years as yeah. opposed to the generation because it's from kid to kid yeah. rather from adult to but child. The paradox is that it's static. It never changes. Now, if this oral form is very conservative. If, or, huh? if we were to follow this, you would destroy uh, the grammar textbook. As no, such. no, no. Well, the word hot to a child is a noun. Stove is an adjective. No, but look, no a child ever made a mistake in slang. You only make a mistake. It's not slang. It's meaning. The word no. hot is more no. important than what but the object that is hot oral. to a child. Uh, gram grammatical errors begin with the written word. When you try to translate the spoken word into written form, there are masses of grammatical errors in the translation. When you merely stick with the spoken word, slang, no mistakes. Now, slang is not easy. It's tricky, it's subtle, it's full of nuance, but no child ever made a mistake. It's like saying no native ever made a mistake in grammar. You know, it's interesting. This fits in here. Anthropologists make mistakes in grammar, but natives don't make grammatical errors. This is interesting. This fits into your idea that you can take the the new furniture and put, you can't take the the new furniture and put it into the old but you can take the old furniture and put it into the new that's right in that uh, that's the rear view mirror you can take the, the, the any any uh, any speech and it's correct grammatically and yet the, the the if you took and said what was written you can make mistakes that's right because if you ask the kids to write down their slang they couldn't do it. It's translating from sound into sight that creates the grammatical problem. Well, the, your question then is more or less in that area. As we move more and more into a sound world, the boundaries between sight and sound or written and oral tend to disappear. More and more. In the same way with photography, it can go across boundaries of any kind. The boundaries that previously of public and private disappear. It invades areas that previously were inviolate and uh, creates new environment of awareness and imagery. I wish you weren't so committed to some of these projects because uh, I'd like to expose you to some people in the photo side. For instance, Bruce Davidson, he just <coughs> completed a project with his students in making a visual vote for Lindsay. Uh -huh. They translated why they voted for him with a camera to be stuck in under his nose to see if he's accomplished this. Well, what nice that uh, can happen as a result? Well, I mean, what came? What did they turn up with? It's about to happen in the uh -huh. second stage now. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, th there's such fascinating uh, overlaps between sound, between politics, and uh, all the things we're talking about. And everybody in New York has a little hand on the elephant. Bruce Davidson, he just <laughs> completed a project with his students in making a visual vote for Lindsay. Uh -huh. They translated why they voted for him with a camera to be stuck in under his nose to see if he's accomplished this. Well, what nice to, to, to happen as a result? What, I mean, what came, what did they turn up with? It's about to happen in the uh -huh. second stage now. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, th there's such fascinating uh, overlaps between sound politics and all the things we're talking about. And everybody in New York has a little hand on the elephant. Tony's got two hands on one. There's nobody like You know the kids joke about what do you see when you lift up an elephant's tail? The engine. Trunk's up front. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'd rely on the kids for most of my jokes. You know, I, uh, I would love to do a movie where I take the character of words that people say, for instance, I use the word, uh, 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 a lot, you know, I say, uh... Very expressive. Now, people, <laughs> I, I'm doing a tape for Lindsay on, he does this in his public appearances, and it cuts down his effect tremendously. So I'm doing a tape taking his, his speeches and showing him if he just were to cut out his us. First, I'm going to give him all his of us first. Then show him that if he cut out his us, how his image changes, just by doing this. And I, I uh, have some uh, Seymour Seagulls giving uh -huh. him. You see, what, you see what would happen if he said, uh-huh, instead of, uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs>
This would make him a very sharp guy. <laughs> the guy was always making discoveries. He'd be like a psychiatrist. Uh-huh. 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 Now, you see, the uh-uh moment is the moment of eureka. I got it. Uh-huh. That's all you have to tell him. Just, just stop this uh stuff and say, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Boy. <laughs> got it made. <laughs> Barry Brown, I think. It wasn't you, I'm sure, said that the word that's or the phrase that's interesting is a cop out. It <laughs> leaves you without saying anything and getting out of. It. Oh yes, this is what you say to a person. Uh, what do you think of this painting? What do you say? Very interesting. interesting. Next question. Uh, Very interesting. Next I question. Heard one, yes, uh, uh, I made a tape for someone. He played it to an actor, and he was very much interested in his reaction, his acting, this guy's acting. Another cause is very sensitive. Okay, another one. Another one is to go whistle, low whistle. Much better than any verbalizer. There you go. But no, but you see, there are people, I have recordings of people where I'll record an hour of them, and through it there are 50 or 100. So he says to me, he says, so I says to him, I says. Or another one will say... So I mean, you see what I mean? And it wasn't so either mean, one of them. And I want to take out those lines and do a film with these words becoming the characters. So one one guy is Mr. You see what I mean? You know, and he goes through life just saying, you see what I mean? You see what I mean? And now that you get children who say, well, <laughs> well, well. That sounds like <laughs> Marvin. Pencil. Have you heard this new song? Have we heard it in the cab today about Marvin? On this. No, oh, you will hear it. You will hear it. There's a new song, this great big hit, Overnight, uh, all about Marvin. Who's that fuzzy fellow? I didn't, didn't give him credit. Didn't credit him with this. What's his name? The, uh, uh, Alan Sherman? Alan Sherman, yeah. It sounds like one of his. By the way, you know the film Never to Return, Canadian Film Board, Dropout? No. no. Well, in it, they have one sequence where a student raises a gun to kill his teacher. And a classroom bell goes off. And I was wondering if that's what you were referring to. As a as an effect of what kind? The bell business before. I oh well, no, the bell, the bell, the the, the uh, community bell, the tolling bell has a tremendous inclusive sound. No, the alarm bell doesn't include nobody. Uh, that means beat it, and the classroom bell means get up. <laughs> um, yeah, you stay. You see, it's high pitch. The community bell has to be a low on. Can I tell you, I'm taking a class in oral perception that you're going to take all dropouts. Oh. I believe that, that they're essentially hey. dropouts. And we heard, I heard a little speech yesterday at a, a conference by Alan Lloyd of McGraw-Hill. And he was showing the effects of using typewriters, instructing with typewriters in classrooms. And he said... Typographical errors, right? He said... The poorer the student, the more they improve, the more they gain from this. And um, that is only another way of saying that the poorer students are really people who use all their senses. And the better students are people who have uh, succeeded in specializing in visual life, just pulling the eye out from the other senses. That's the top student in our world. It doesn't mean that he's brainy. It just means that he's specialist in his sensory life. Now, this happens in Toronto. There's a conundrum connected with the uh, observed fact that the slow grades 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 are the ones who learn to speak French quickly. The fast grades, the top people, never learn to speak it. You can't learn to speak a language by eye. So it's these dumbbells who use all their senses who learn French. They can get at it with all their senses. You see, you, know, you learn a language mainly by ear and by rhythm. I have a French friend who says there are no words in French. There are only rhythms. It makes it difficult for an English person to hear French. No words. <laughs> Just rhythm. But the, the linguist says this is true of all languages, that basically they are rhythms and not words. How many languages do you speak? I could uh, make out a little bit of French. That's about all. How about you? Well, some hillbilly Russian oh, and English. Well. well, I can talk a lot of dialects. I have no, no trouble with dialects. It's just that I've never studied languages. 
I'm, I'm a monolingual guy. Well, I have always had a great facility with picking up the local dialect in uh, Ireland or Texas or Devonshire or anywhere. <laughs> well, you know, it's easier to do it when you're sort of in the environment. <laughs> but uh, you, know, you need to hear, get the rhythm feeling. It gets going, you know. But uh, after all, I have a Texas wife, and uh, it isn't too hard uh, for me to do Texas. But uh, she, in turn, does many other dialects, you know, except that she prefers the Alabama or the Georgian or Mississippi or anything to Texas. But uh, these, um, and notice the new TV generation kids, they love putting on dialects. They love to mimic dialects. I don't remember kids doing that in my time. Now, I think you'll find that uh, uh, empathy, TV is an empathic Well, that just as radio was added to silent pictures as soundtrack, so TV uh, has tended to retain the movie soundtrack, which is a radio form, in spite of the fact that the images for which the sound is provided have nothing in common. So the, I haven't uh, tried to imagine myself what should be the soundtrack for TV. It would certainly not be a hi-fi sound like radio or gramophone. It might well be more in the um, electronic music vein. Uh, it might. I don't know. Uh, there's no reason why you can't have different sorts of soundtracks. But uh, it hasn't uh, occurred to anybody to work out a soundtrack for TV that would uh, be completely different from uh, the movie one. It's somewhat like this, though, that just as the movie used as its content the old medium, every new medium uses as its content the old one, and um, the movie used the novel, a storyline, and TV went on using the movie storyline, despite the fact it is not a narrative medium. The one difference that I see possible is the fact that you can take... I find the greater tendency and the more success just comes from using sound and counterpoint to image rather than using matching. it matching. You see, that's one, one area. Because counterpoint is making, not magic. You make, and when you make something, this involves the uh, participant or the viewer very much more than just matching. Matching, though, is a normal activity for the, the visual world. It is not a natural activity for the auditory or the um, other senses. Could you give me the line, just in <laughs> simple English, think the medium is the message? The medium is the message is... Uh, exa another is, is perfect example of any medium using the old medium as content. Uh, the medium creates an environment that uh, is a sort of infallible teaching machine that works on the sensory life of, of the population. And so if you substitute for message, massage, you get the idea that what the medium does is to make a new environment that really works into the whole innards of people and massages them. It, it's a process. Oh, a medium, the medium is a process. The content is not. It's the old medium that had already done the, the massaging long ago. Now, the new medium is a new massage uh, treatment, and uh, the content is always the old medium, uh, as with silence or whatnot on TV. You say it always is? Always, yes. I don't know of any exceptions. See, when Plato began to write down words for the first time, he wrote down the old oral tradition. He wrote down the words of Socrates, who belonged to the previous culture. And uh, this goes right on through. The first 200 years of printing did nothing but print medieval literature. Right, but then what about the after that? The same. The, uh, you see, it's like the horseless carriage. It's uh, uh, the old buggy uh, dolled up, uh, put the horse in the cart, and away we go. Um, the, uh, I was thinking uh, 
just today about the uh, phrase for the uh, safety car is rocking the bandwagon because what the safety car amounts to is putting the public in the carriage and by the time the, the public now insists on being included in the carriage in order to feel safe and uh, this in effect rocks the bandwagon all to bits it's the end of the car the safety car equals end of car it did oh well um, it would be nice if nothing would take its place for a while but uh, the uh, chances are we're going to have three-dimensional transportation after all we live in the age of the rocket the jet the airplane uh, why we haven't had three-dimensional transportation at all levels long ago I don't know but vertical no after all the uh, uh, horizontal transportation is uh, is now a uh, uh, ancient history and uh, the new speeds of the society are all adjusting to non-horizontal you know the discomfort that people feel in going to and from airports there's uh, something wrong everybody feels this shouldn't this shouldn't happen um, I'm only going to fly for an hour once I get off the ground and here it takes me over an hour to get out there something wrong but uh, oh well anyway any any medium creates an environment the environment is a process that just twists the guts of people that's the message but the essence of folklore and write folk songs about their life they go to other musics they go to mountain music they go to uh, no that's partly rearview mirror it's easier to see things at, at a distance in another culture um, the kids um, if you ask a kid, a freshman in a school, to write an autobiography of themselves, it's impossible. They have no image of themselves at all. Uh, they, they, they can give a few statistics, and uh, they just I always say, uh, say, I'm just an ordinary kid. I uh, went to high school, and now here I am in college, and that's it. That's, that's all they can see of themselves. Uh, but they can see their neighbors. They can see other people much more clearly. Autobiography is very difficult because the, the image we form of ourselves is invisible, except to others. You see, from moment to moment, we make an image based on the, what we hear and feel. And, and see, uh, we make a body image of ourselves all the time. From every waking moment, we have a body image. It's changing. It's invisible. You can't see it. It's total environment. It is so total that it's invisible. All environments, though, are invisible. Esquire conducted an experiment in one December issue where they asked famous people to do a sketch of themselves and answer seven questions at any length. And it was very revealing. Whatever anyone did, Fred Astaire did the longest one and very revealing about himself. But if you can tie it down to specific questions, I think you can hit at this rather than letting them loose. There you go. You better turn that back on. It's getting real warm in here. I find, I'm very grateful for the voice in having it all. One of the uh, things I was in Washington recently, I find that the, every everywhere you go, it's air conditioned. It's, it's terribly hard on the voice. Terribly hard on allergies, which I seem to experience. Yeah, it was good to get out of there. Well, I'll look at the bag when it comes and uh, think about it. But uh, I don't, you see, uh, I don't uh, exhaust uh, the areas that I study. I, I just sample. I look for contours, structures. I don't fill them in. I'm with you. With you. This is exactly what we need. Well, what would be interesting to know, what are some of the key changes in photography that have occurred in, say, the last 10 years? You have to see it really try. Have you ever shot a Polaroid picture? No, I've seen friends do it all the time. Have you ever made a videotape? I have, actually. Have uh, you ever seen yourself on 21 screens? No, time? heaven forbid. No, I, I think that uh, after all, a happening, after even, Her Hercules, you know, even Hercules only had to clean the Aegean stables once. <laughs> 21 times. 
Boy, what a thing to wipe off. But, uh, you know, the, these, uh, by the way, this is inherent in uh, TV more than in movie, multiple, multiple screens, is because when you have multiple screen, you don't have a storyline. The movie favors storyline much more than TV. TV doesn't need storyline. It's more iconic. It can deal with the separate, unconnected screens much better than... Now you're referring to Eames, IBM, right? No, I'm not referring to anything. Just structure. That the nature of TV favors multiple screens. It is being held to the one screen by, by movie form. Rear view mirror. What is, what's this one about? I think... Where am I going? What's this one about? This is about the Electronic Museum. Huh? Read a little of that. This one of the things, oh well, can't talk about it. That, no, it's just about two. Uh, the electronic museum made by home. Well, no, this is his idea of what, what's, what the computer can do to museums. Yep. Oh, I know. I've been thinking about it. By the way, we're sending the first Marshall McLuhan care package to Europe. What's that mean? Gutenberg Galaxy, Messages Medium, and for your speeches to uh, several photographers who just aren't with it and are kind of stuck. Well, and I'm anxious to uh, use your word to hear what the feedback is going to be. Well, spare me. <laughs> I can imagine. The son of a gun, Jerry Stern, is uh, printing a whole batch of violently hostile book reviews of Gutenberg Galaxy and Understanding Medium in a book. Great. And uh, he's making, he's uh, no, he's making comments, and I'm making comments on each of the reviews as we go. Now, in other words, we're using these as a means of revealing uh, all sorts of things. If I were you, I would show up in the Village Voice office. Oh. Some afternoon. I never read that. I heard about it. Why don't you just show up there and ask him for the copies? Uh, you'd upset that whole damn place. Like, you just say it. But, uh, do that as dessert something. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, would I need a bodyguard? No, love no. The guy who the guy who wrote that, I, I assume, was the sort of guy who, one afternoon at NYU when I was on a panel, um, and I it was the afternoon I got soaking wet and had to uh, go onto the platform in the evening with my wet these clothes soaking. Um, I couldn't, uh, Saturday afternoon you can't get any pressing done in New York, uh, literally. I mean, uh, no, that's not a figure of speech. I, I spent 4.50 in a cab going around every pressing establishment in New York City. And uh, valet services at Grand Central everywhere, no hope. Um, but yeah. this old guy, in between these miseries that I went through that day, he kept barging in, trying to get something from me. And I said, well, now look, I'm going to be speaking. I, and I, have you read my books? He says, no. Well, I'll be saying a lot of things that are in the books tonight on this speech. And so on. Why don't you let that go for an interview? Oh, I guess it made him real mad. But um, anyway, he was a real nuisance. Why? He was a nuisance all that afternoon. And because I was in public, I, well, I, there was no privacy. And so I guess this happened as a result. doesn't do any harm, does it? Not at all. You ought to thank these guys. Because for a while, you were going off there with no blocks, nobody uh, standing in your way, and it was too good to be true. And it couldn't happen today. As these guys build up, you'll get stronger. It'll be more fascinating. You know, one of the amazing things about the computer is that it's, it's all now being set to do the old job. Even museums, you see, are merely story systems. Um, the real power of the computer is as a source of discovery. That is, when by interface you retrieve information at high speeds, you can, by banging various things against each other, reveal all sorts of structural facts about them that were completely hidden before. Now, this is true in language, which is a retrieval system also. When you recall things cockeyed, you usually make discoveries. That's when the pun or the slip of speech comes out to uh, aid in discovery. And... Uh, the uh, slip of the tongue is usually a revealing moment. Uh, yeah, like I, people say to me, you know, see, you lost a lot of weight. It must take a lot of willpower. So, no, it takes willpower. I won't eat this. I won't eat that. <laughs> I, I had willpower before. I will eat that. I will eat that. <laughs> it takes willpower. 
Delhi. Marshall, can we have a visual church? Can we replace the pulpit with a screen and all the oh. icons with TV sets? Well, a TV as a liturgical means is far more potent than actual presence in the church. Uh, in following the Mass, for example, uh, most uh, Catholics feel right off in their first encounter with it on TV that they had never really seen it before. It's much more participative than being in the church. There's so much like the church, it's not very much like the concert hall, full of distractions, lateral, horizontal distractions of uh, other people in crazy clothes and crazy voices and <laughs> crazy everything. This creates a huge distraction that TV eliminates. Um, well, this having what effect you have in mind? Oh, you tend to be more isolated then. The dark theater. We have a church in Greenwich Village where it's given over to artists. Jazz musicians play a mass that they <coughs> created themselves. Both mass. Uh, yeah, they, they just sit down and they, they do their movies in there. That they make. Have you spoken? Uh -huh. Have you spoken? Oh, of well, William Glenesk's church. It's a Presbyterian one over right. in Brooklyn. No, no, that's not it. That's, no. This is in the village. No. No. I'm just wondering how, uh, and if, maybe in Canada this has been applied there. Well, you know, in backward countries you can do things that you can't do in more advanced countries because, the, I mean, literally, there's a bigger backlog, you see, of, a, of applied and uh, conventional wisdom to overcome before you can do anything new. In areas where they haven't tried to do anything new, ever, uh, you don't have the same obstacles to overcome in innovation. It's like Ghana or somewhere like that. You can race ahead into the 20th century uh, there far faster than you can in Brooklyn or New York. There's no backlog of technology. Or There's That's no right. technology to obstruct whatever. All right, can I ask you a question about Ghana? Can we develop a system of closed-circuit justice? since there is a shortage of lawyers and judges. No, uh, you have uh, to face the fact you can't put the old judicial procedures on a new medium. You can't have a jury trial by jury on TV. The relation of... circuit where the judge is... No, no, the point, no, the point is that the involvement of the people in each other is different from uh, their involvement in, as in this room. Their relation to one another changes. So electronic they're in show business. Business. They're in show business. The moment they go on to TV, they're in show business. And aren't, aren't lawyers in show business continually? Yeah. But they, 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 there are some people in the court who are supposed not to be. The judge and the jury are not supposed to be in show business. On TV, they are. And they act accordingly. Changes their whole relation to the... Victim. So you're against cameras in the court of any kind? No. No. I'm no. literally telling you what happened. I'm it changes the whole nature of judicial procedure. It, it would not be the same in a few months. Uh, everything would have to be it rearranged. It changes the size of the show. It, uh, <laughs> that's right. Well, did you, did you ever see the, we have to get going. Did you ever read the story or I mean, the situation where the uh, defense attorney wanted to take away the attention of the jury while the prosecution was talking? stuck a wire paper clip inside the cigar, just stood there smoking, and let the ash hang on, on, and the whole jury was watching that ash. When is that going Well, you know, this and happened in a PhD, <laughs> this happened in a PhD oral. The student put a great big uh, sort of knitting needle in his cigar and uh, held, held the ash on from beginning to end of his oral, hypnotized his examiner. <laughs> <laughs> they were helpful. <laughs> Where are these guys <laughs> well, That's great stuff. Imagine a commercial you can do with this. Why aren't you applying to the commercial? It's for Groucho. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, you're right. See, this, uh, I have a friend who should know about this. Uh, I should make this little note. Uh, it's um, Art in America, uh, March, April. Art in America, March, April, 66. Uh, electronic Museum. Harley should know that. Yeah, Harley. Harley Parker is doing a book on museums 
past, present, future, and uh, with his eye on un unused potential. Well, it's been fun. But, uh, let's see. I'll see you here. I'll see you when I get back next week. Okay, I'll get up some uh, demonstrations of material. Maybe if I can even work on them before well, well, next Why don't you let them help out? Okay. They've got a great library staff yeah, but there. They won't, resources. They won't be related. Well, no, but ask them to get some material to, yes. to show changing well, they, uh, visual image with soundtrack. Well, that I think I can uh, oh, yeah, but, uh, take some things you know, that I have both four. If you can save yourself some bother. Well, I have no one. Oh, that's right. Thank you very much. Is that the museum? Uh, uh, can you stay with me? Yeah. Uh, well, this is so fascinating. We haven't even scratched the surface. That's yet. true. I hope one time we can get together with some of the uh, okay. pictures uh, yeah. that we're involved with. Around. Oh, no, I had see, a see you again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. You also have to have a YouTube page Oh, Charlie Arnold's one of his teachers, I bet. Uh, yes, is he yes. graduating this year? Thanks, Tony. Yes. Yes, one more year to go. Send him down, will you? Wow. Oh, oh right. we're very close to the right. Jack, you know, you guys, writers. Here's Sucker Jack. And, uh, gee, how can I do it? It's a hell of a feel. Oh, as you probably know, you're involved in it. Oh, I'll be around until 5 o'clock, and I'll be out from 5 to 7.30. Maybe. Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that just as radio was added to silent pictures as soundtrack. So TV uh, has tended to retain the movie soundtrack, which is a radio form, in spite of the fact that the images for which the sound is provided have nothing in common. So the I haven't uh, tried to imagine myself what should be the soundtrack for TV. It the moment you accept the uh, world as a recording studio, you have accepted the environment as an art form. Uh, this is uh, only possible when you have an other electronic environment of information that uh, goes totally around the globe itself, uh, enclosing the globe, as it were, in a net of electric information that uh, turns the globe, the habitat, uh, what had previously been the human environment, now becomes the content of an electric man-made environment, and we then suddenly become tremendously self-conscious of all the sounds and effects of that environment as if it were a work of art. This uh, is uh, the moment of pop art. It's one, it's one thing to put a tomato can in the, in the Guggenheim uh, as a stunt, but as a, an artistic gesture, it is really a, way of, a gesture. It's really a way of saying that the environment of man has now become an art form. Okay. okay. We think of humor as a mark of sanity for a good reason. In fun and play, we recover the integral person who in the workaday world or in professional life... No, is this? Oh, oh yes, I meant... All right, fine, excuse me. Yes. yes or, or in professional life can use only a small sector of his being. When a person is using all his faculties at once, he's playing, he's, he's at leisure. The artist never works, although he is often intensely involved in his creative activity. He's always at leisure because he's using all his faculties. 
And in the same way, games, like hobbies, are popular art, collective, social uh, reactions to the main driver action in any culture. Games like institutions are extensions of social man and of the body politic, as technologies are extensions of the animal organism. Both games and technologies are counter-irritants, or ways of adjusting to the stress of uh, specialized actions that occur in any social group. As extensions of the popular response to the workaday stress, games become faithful models of a culture. They incorporate both the action and the reaction of whole populations in a single dynamic image. It would be unthinkable, for example, to uh, imagine ourselves paying attention to games from another culture, cricket, for example. Uh, in the same way, until you have an audience participating in the action of the game, there isn't any game. It's merely a dress rehearsal until there is an actual audience participant. In other words, games require audience as actors, not just as uh, spectators. The wide appeal of games of recent times, the popular sports of baseball and football and ice hockey, seen as outer models of inner psychological life, become understandable. As models, they are collective rather than private dramatizations of inner life. You couldn't really have a game that was a merely private um, image or a private uh, model of action. It does require this corporate uh, response, and it does require this kind of involvement in the total life of a culture in order for it to be a game at all. What does solitaire mean? I suppose a little bit like golf, which means uh, pursuing your own immediate problems and uh, immediate moves, but it, it isn't a game I've ever played myself, but it is, an, a, a, by definition, it is an extreme uh, form of game uh, which excludes as much as possible of the corporate life. I suppose, however, it dramatizes the needs of the individual to adjust to a limited set of components, cards, plays. Uh, it, it is a way of uh, harassed individuals confronting the rather limited conditions of their existence. Uh, it, it tends, uh, if you see uh, someone playing solitaire uh, in a movie or in a, on a stage, uh, you know that there is a, a kind of stressful situation. Uh, it, it records, it reflects some sort of inner stress, uh, almost to a degree of comedy. Art and games enable us to stand aside from the pressures of routine and convention, observing and questioning. Games as popular art forms offer to all an immediate means of participation in the full life of a society, such as no single role or job can offer to any man. You know, we have phrases like the newspaper game. Um, and the newspaper as game, or the business game, is a way of exploring the environment, of finding out what it's made of, testing it, trying it on, putting it on. In fact, I suppose one could say that games are really a way of putting on one's fellow man. Rocket Richard the um, famous Canadian hockey player uh, used to complain about the acoustics of the Maple Leaf Stadium in Toronto, uh, explaining that it interfered altogether with his game as compared with a, a forum in Montreal. He felt that the puck off his stick rode on the roar of the crowd when he was in a good acoustic situation. And uh, this is, I suppose, an extreme example of the way in which audience participation makes a game possible. Sport as a popular form is not just self-expression, but is deeply and necessarily a means of interplay within an entire culture. Seen as live models of complex social situations, games may lack moral earnestness. Uh, perhaps there is 
desperate need for games in a highly specialized industrial culture since they are the only form of art accessible to many minds. Real interplay is reduced to nothing in a specialist world of delegated tasks and fragmented skills and jobs. The games create countervailing force. They uh, prevent us from bogging down into too grim earnest. Men without art and men without popular arts of games tend toward the anthill, the world of automatism. Art, like games, is a translator of experience, a way of probing the life around us. What we have already felt or seen in one situation, we are suddenly given in a new kind of material in, in the form of games. Games likewise shift familiar experience into new forms, giving the bleak and the blear side of things sudden luminosity. And to flip back a moment to the newspaper game, it has often been noticed and often caused a certain amount of puzzlement why real news has to be bad news. Good news just wouldn't do to keep a newspaper alive. After all, advertising is all good news. And uh, real news, on the other hand, has to have a catastrophic <clears throat> dimension. I think perhaps the reason for this is that in the catastrophe or in the disaster, in the bad news, you have the encounter of different kinds of forms. You have the revelation of forms, the life of forms, by contrast and encounter. In other words, the exploratory, uh, the discovery aspect of art and game comes alive in this encounter of situations which we associate with bad news and disasters. Games then are contrived and control situations, extensions of group awareness that permit a respite from customary patterns. They're a kind of talking to itself on the part of a society as a whole. Talking to oneself is a recognized form of play that is indispensable to any growth of self-confidence. The British and Americans have enjoyed during recent times an enormous self-confidence born of the playful spirit of fun games. When they sense the absence of this spirit in their rivals, it causes embarrassment. I take mere worldly things in dead earnest betokens a defective awareness that is pitiable. That games are extensions not of our private, but of our social selves, and that they are media of communication should now be plain. If finally we ask, are games mass media? The answer has to be yes. And games are situations contrived to permit simultaneous participation of many people in some significant pattern of their own corporate lives. Patterns that may remain distant and inaccessible to most people except as they encounter them in games. This uh, can be related also to that phrase that I came up with a while back. that the medium is the massage. Uh, this should appear especially obvious in matter of games. The massage or the rough handling of people by people and the banging of one situation into another situation is deliberately contrived, is deliberately explained, as it were, in our social mass communication form of games. The medium is the massage uh, refers to the fact that any new medium creates an environment which really deals rather roughly with old environments and with people in the old environments. And games are subject to a good many vicissitudes and changes. Uh, as baseball has tended to fade with TV, so has boxing. Uh, boxing is altogether too abrupt too violent, too sudden, too harsh a, an encounter, a massage, uh, for this medium, as compared with, for example, with all in wrestling, where the massage is altogether more congenial to 
uh, the medium of TV. Uh, in fact, all in wrestling is mainly a product of TV and uh, is showmanship and showbiz all the way. Um, boxing, by comparison, is too harsh, too hot, too sudden. Have not the uh, New York police issued instructions in recent years to uh, the population that if individually they should be in trouble, they should not ask for help. They should shout fire. This is a very extraordinary suggestion, which may have helped to explain the difference between a hot game like boxing and a cool game like wrestling. Uh, the involvement in wrestling is much greater than in boxing. The, in boxing, the uh, performers are much more detached. And they're, in fact, they're told to break clean in the clinches. They're invited to stay as separate as possible. Whereas in wrestling, they're expected to be as involved as possible. Wrestling has come back big with TV. Boxing has declined drastically with TV. People don't respond to cries for help because they already feel involved. They don't want to get involved one little bit more than they already are in their private lives. On the other hand, fire is like boxing. It suggests merely, let's rush in and put out this fire and then beat it. It doesn't suggest involvement but merely in a, a sudden, swift encounter. But cries for help uh, are terrifying because they suggest that we're going to get even further involved in some a situation of which we have no idea. And so the mystery, I think, about why people have tended to stand by and watch innocent people get clobbered in our world since TV may be uh, understandable in these terms. Uh, in, in, in fun and play, we are, you know. We think of humor as a mark of sanity for a good reason. In fun and play, we recover the integral person who in the workaday world or in professional life can, can use only a small sector of his being. Classing in sport. Right, is, is, start is, that again, the mere idea of a magazine. Yes, the mere idea of a magazine specializing in sport is a rather startling when you think of it. It does suggest that the world of games has uh, been upgraded uh, greatly in uh, our new electric world and uh, that the participation in games is, is taking on new forms as for example in baseball on TV uh, it's plain that the um, a viewer participates far more in the mysteries the processes of baseball the signals used, the strategies used between uh, batters, catchers, pitchers, and uh, base coaches, and uh, such. Also, with the coming of instant playback, you have a tremendous means of involvement in the process of games, which is very congenial to the TV viewer. Um, the world of process and uh, the art and uh, mystery of games as a complex uh, process uh, is something that um, TV has fostered and would seem to account for the popularity of a thing like Sports Illustrated, which offers unlimited expression for this very matter of artistic interest in the uh, game as a uh, process. Take the whole statement on that. One of the paradoxical reversals of democracy under conditions of electric technology brings the individual member of society to do, uh, to exactly the same condition uh, formerly uh, confronting royalty in older societies. The work of royalty was, and to a large degree is, not the uh, preparing for any particular job in life, but simply growing up. Uh, growing up meaning the use of all faculties, learning all things, and under electric conditions this has become increasingly the destiny of uh, ordinary individuals. They have to uh, simply know everything that's going on in their world. They have to grow up They're using all their faculties at once. Instead of specializing, using just a few of their faculties to acquire a particular skill, they have to use all their faculties and simply to know and to grow. This uh, is therefore uh, far harder work 
than the old idea of job preparation, but uh, far more exciting because uh, far more satisfying to an integral being. The population of the world can be comfortably fed and housed in West Germany or Montana. What was that? The entire population can be comfortably fed and housed, lots of space, in West Germany or in Montana. Um, they, now, with the new means of uh, new resources, scientific, scientific resources for getting yield out of things, they, therefore what we call pop crowding and population explosion and so on is mainly a result of trying to fit a new situation inside an old situation. It's, a, it's again this media clash. And uh, so, again, population explosion has not got very much to do with the number, increasing number of people. It has very much to do with the fact that at high speeds of information, there's no space between people anymore. All space has been removed between people. They're suddenly crammed together like a black hole of Calcutta. This having very little to do with numbers, very much to do with speed. And uh, same with the mass media. Mass media are not constituted by their size, but by the speed with which they operate and the degree to which they involve their audiences. The uh, mass is, a, is a, fun a function of speed. Mass means all at once. No, it means all at once. And you know anything that moves at the speed of a light is supposed to, by, in terms of modern physics, to acquire infinite mass. Well, so if you take the definition or the, the thought I have when you say mass, I think of a body of some kind. Yeah. So this is a body of opinion all at once, a body of reaction all at once. But if a, if a small particle could acquire infinite mass at, at, electric, at a speed of light, this helps to explain many of our problems in the modern world. Trivial news events can acquire huge and portentous proportions at electric speeds. And we are compelled to participate in, in the wars around the world simply because of speed of information movement. You said at one point elections were obsolete in that NBC show. Can you expand on that at all? Well, nose counting, uh, fragmentation of opinion, nose counting, goes very much along with typographic technology. Uh, typographic technology creates a public made up of discrete, separate individuals, each with a point of view. At electric speeds, 